Okay, let's go ahead and get started with week three. I am Mrs. Blanco, your professor for this course. I received very positive feedback for um, doing the video lectures instead of just a written one. So we're gonna go ahead and continue with that as we can. So today I thought I'd let you know what kind of tool I'm working with in order to capture my video lectures. Some of you may have heard of something called Screencast-O-Matic. It's a free download. This is kind of what the home page looks like. You can either download it or you can record it directly from your browser, which is a pretty cool feature. If you are working with the free version, you can record up to 15 minutes of video. Um, there are also some other slight differences, but the main one is free 15 minutes of video and with the pro version, which is $15 a year, you have unlimited recording. So um, I go ahead and pay for the unlimited features because I use it quite a bit in my role as an ed tech specialist. But I wanted to let you know what I'm using. So week three is actually one of my favorite units. It has to do, do with searching on the web. Um, I'm going to get us started by just watching a quick video and I'm gonna go ahead and play it. It is by Matt Cutts, who is actually a Google engineer. So sit back and enjoy. Hi, my name is Matt Cutts. I'm an engineer in the quality group at Google, and I'd like to talk today about what happens when you do a web search. The first thing to understand is that when you do a Google search, you aren't actually searching the web. You're searching Google's index of the web, or at least as much of it as we can find. We do this with software programs called spiders. Spiders start by fetching a few web pages, then they follow the links on those pages and fetch the pages they point to, and follow all the links on those pages and fetch the pages they link to, and so on, until we've indexed a pretty big chunk of the web. Many billions of pages stored across thousands of machines. Now, suppose I want to know how fast a cheetah can run. I type in my search, say, cheetah running speed, and hit return. Our software searches our index to find every page that includes those search terms. In this case, there are hundreds of thousands of possible results. How does Google decide which few documents I really want? By asking questions, more than 200 of them, like, how many times does this page contain your keywords? Do the words appear in the title, in the URL, directly adjacent? Does the page include synonyms for those words? Is this page from a quality website, or is it low quality, even spammy? What is this page's page rank? That's a formula invented by our founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, that rates a web page's importance by looking at how many outside links point to it and how important those links are. Finally, we combine all those factors together to produce each page's overall score and send you back your search results about half a second after you submit your search. At Google, we take our commitment to delivering useful and impartial search results very seriously. We don't ever accept payment to add a site to our index, update it more often, or improve its ranking. Let's take a look at my search results. Each entry includes a title, a URL, and a snippet of text to help me decide whether this page is what I'm looking for. I also see links to similar pages, Google's most recent stored version of that page, and related searches that I might want to try next. And sometimes, along the right, and at the top, I'll see ads. We take our advertising business very seriously as well, both our commitment to deliver the best possible audience for advertisers, and to strive to only show ads that you really want to see. We're very careful to distinguish your ads from regular search results. And we won't show you any ads at all if we can't find any that we think will help you find the information you're looking for. Which in this case, the cheetah's top running speed is more than 60 miles an hour. Thanks for watching. I hope this made Google a little bit more understandable. All right, so that's how search works according to Google um, and Matt Cuts. So hopefully you enjoyed that video by Google. I am gonna go ahead and give you an example. Let me hide the previous one that I was doing. Let's say I'm a social studies teacher 
and I am teaching about the lost city of Atlantis. Now, um, I just typed that in my Omnibox. That's what that's called in Google Chrome. It's a nice, just little feature in Google Chrome um, that makes searching a little bit quicker. If I press enter, I'm gonna get a whole slew of results. The first one tells me that it is um, the Atlantis Resorts and Residences in Dubai. That's probably not in what I'm looking for if I am trying to teach social studies in a high school setting. As I continue to look down or even scroll down, the second one is by Wikipedia. Now, I am actually a big fan of Wikipedia because of all the sources that it provides for students. So that site may or may not be of help to us. As I go down further, here's another result um, from the Bahamas for a resort. Here's another one that may be useful, the lost civilizations. Um, scrolling further down, oh, there's another resort. The next two seem to be reviews from maybe movies or TV shows. And lastly, I have the Atlantis Casino Resort Spa in Reno. So another resort, resort that's come up in my search results. Now, like most adults, students are just going to be searching the first page and choosing um, from whatever they get to use in their research or for paper writing or whatever the case may be. Today, I'm gonna to teach you about those search operators, which will help you eliminate and narrow down your searches to find the information that you're really looking for. So, what I'm going to do in my search is narrow it down a little further by using a feature um, with the minus sign. So, like we've noticed, I did get a lot of queries or results come up for resorts. I want to eliminate that from my searches. So I'm going to type a, whoops, it helps if I spell correctly. I'm going to type a minus in my search box and I'm going to subtract resorts from my results. So now when I search, it has eliminated those results from my search. So now you can see that the first one is Wikipedia this time. Then I've got two more. Then I still have those movies and TV shows. Oh, here's a better one. This National Geographic one was not here before. Now my results are getting better. Here's one from BBC America, the official website for America's series Atlantis. Mm, we'll have to check on that one. But as I go down, my terms are getting better and better. So you can have multiple search operators in your queries. I'm going to scroll back up to the top of my page. This time I'm also going to subtract movies and let's see what happens. No longer are those reviews of the movie Atlantis in my search results. So I could subtract TV series and see what happens, but what's happening is my results are getting more and more specific to my needs. Um, searching is definitely a critical thinking skill. It's one that's important to teach our students and there's no better way of doing that than actually modeling it for your kids. Next time they ask you a question and you don't know the answer, don't be afraid to actually go through the steps of searching in Google or Yahoo or Bing, whatever search engine you prefer, and taking them through those steps. When you have those discussions with your kiddos, you are actually helping your students search better. It's really metacognitive. They're thinking about their thinking. They're thinking about what they're searching for, thinking about the process they need to go through. And then if it's an assignment or something you ask them about, they're reflecting on what they did to come up with those search results. So it be, it, it's just simply searching on the web can become pretty powerful for kids as long as we're teaching them the correct way to do it. So the next thing I thought I would share with you is something called exact phrases. Anytime you search like with song lyrics or with certain words together, you, if you 
do it a certain way, you'll only get those results. For example, if I'm just searching for story of a girl um, and I put the quotation marks around it, it's going to narrow my search down quite significantly. If I don't put those quotation marks in, I might get the story of a Midwestern girl or check out this story of a girl I saw online. Um, I'm trying to get those terms very, very succinct, just like we did with Atlantis. So when I hit the enter button, um, I did get 697,000 results in less than one, one and a half seconds. It is narrowing it down to a few videos, um, but I can definitely pull those lyrics like I was looking for. Again, because I'm using the exact phrase for the story of a girl, I was able to get um, exactly the lyrics and nothing in between. So um, you can see now that I have a website pulled up um, or search terms pulled up, search screens pulled up for Martin Luther King Jr. What we're gonna get ready to talk about is finding information on the web and determining whether or not it's really credible information or if it's really true or not. Um, there's that joke that goes around that, well, if it was on the internet, it must be true. Obviously, we know that's not correct, but that's something we need to explicitly teach our students as well. So I went ahead and put the terms Martin Luther King into Google, and I came up with a bunch of results. As we're going through this activity, I want you to keep an acronym in mind. It is the word real, R-E-A-L, and we're going to go through each of those letters and talk about what they stand for. Now, this is something that you can do with kids anywhere from K-12, as long as they understand the vocabulary and the sites and the information you're introducing them to, in order to evaluate a resource and find out if it's really credible. So the R represents the word, read your sources. So I'm using dual screens. I'm just going to pull up my notes um, over here on my other computer real quick. So like I said, R stands for read the URL. We're going to see, um, again, a bunch of sites that pull up. Here's one from Wikipedia. Here's another one, biography, civil rights activists. Nice, that looks like a good one. History.com. Um, I'm going to continue going down. Oh, look at this one, www.martinlutherking.org. I am reading the URL. That sounds like it's a pretty good site. And I'm going to scroll down and so on and so on. So let's go ahead and click on that one that says martinlutherking.org. Now, I do want to put out this little disclaimer. We're using this for class purposes. This is not necessarily something I would share with students you are going to see um, maybe some inappropriate things pop up during this lecture. So I'm gonna go ahead and click there. Now I am using my skills and my acronym of real and moving on to the word E, the, or the letter E and the word real. E stands for evaluate. At first glance, just looking at this site, um, there's some things that pop out to me. So when we first looked at the URL, it had a .org domain name. So we know it is by an organization. Um, at first glance, this site just doesn't look very professional to me. Um, it just doesn't look like anybody really put the effort into it that a site like this would deserve. Um, I look around a little farther, I see some inappropriate language, um, some rap lyrics, and I'm thinking to myself, that might not be something that I would think would be on a credible site about Martin Luther King. Um, so I'm going to continue looking at this, this site. It doesn't look super professional. We've already talked about that. Um, it's talking about Maybe the King holiday being repealed. Mm, that's another thing that just sticks out to me based upon my background knowledge of Martin Luther King Jr. So the next 
indicator that should really make us think twice is you can't really find an author on this page. So I've scrolled all the way down to the bottom and I'm still not finding an author in this site. So I'm just gonna open up a new tab and I'm going to put in the site easydomaincheck.com. I'm going to just copy and paste with a control C. I'm on a PC, control V. I'm going to hit enter and let's see what it pops up. It's got a bunch of information that's popping up here on the right. Um, some of the things they're not providing, but if I continue to just kind of scroll through here and says that the registrant's name is Don Black, the organization is Stormfront. So now I'm getting the opportunity just to dig a little bit deeper to see what the site is all about. So I'm going to, again, open up another tab, search for Stormfront, and maybe Martin Luther King Jr. Let's see what pops up. Well, there's the site we were just looking about. Look at this. If you enter Martin Luther King Jr. as a search term, the site netting, it's telling you right away that this is created by a white supremacist site. If I do some further resource research, um, it's just giving me more and more information that's telling me that this site is not reliable. Um, even this last one, dissing the king. So, um, probably something that you can use to teach kids. I wouldn't use that specific site unless my kids were maybe in high school just because of some of the content. Um, but there are a lot of other sites out there that you could do the same thing with. So we did real. So far we've done the, the R, which is read the domain or read the URL. We've done E, which is evaluate. We also did A, that was the third one that stood for author. And the last one we're gonna do the L stands for link. So one thing that can help you figure out how credible a site is, is to click on the links inside it and see where it takes you. So um, I'm just clicking on a couple of these. I'm seeing where they're taking me and what kind of information it's giving me. Well, this one again is talking about repealing the holiday. Um, Civil Rights Liberty didn't really take me outside of the site. I can tell because it's got the same exact background. Um, the King Holiday, Bring the Dream to Life. Again, same kind of background. I know it's the same site. It just looks the same as the one before. Um, another indicator about whether a site is really reliable or not is if it has a lot of broken links. Maybe it's an okay site, but it just hasn't been updated in a while. So real, use it with your kids, um, teach them how to evaluate those resources. You can either print out like um, just the acronym on a little scratch sheet of paper and give it to kids and have them fill out those four letters as they're going through a site evaluating their resources. Okay, we're going to go ahead and try and continue. Again, I apologize for the choppiness. <laughs> My baby Avery's having some issues with bedtime tonight, so don't be surprised if you hear her crying again. I'm not ignoring her. Her daddy's upstairs, so it's all good in the Blanco household. Um, let's go ahead and continue with our lecture. So a lot of people ask me, how do you learn all of these cool little tips and tricks from Google and one place I have learned them is from something that Google provides which is called the power searching with Google so I just put that into my Omni box again up at the very top of the page it's actually my second link that's come up and it's taking you to some activities created by Google to teach you the ins and outs of searching. So this site is called Power Searching by Google. Sorry about that, I have a few pop-ups. 
Um, the lessons are pretty short. The videos are short. They will share a quick tip and then kind of take you through an activity that you can do. Um, again, these are created and taught by a Google engineer. Um, it tells you that you'll learn how to find just what you're looking for, how to get the right answers, find the most credible source, and solve even the most challenging questions. I have gone through this class. Let's just go ahead and click now where it says start now. I have not gone through the advanced power searching, but I did go through the um, introductory one, the self-paced course. Again, it's pretty cool that it is self-paced, so you can stop and go back to it if you have a little or a lot of interruptions like I do in my household sometimes. Um, pretty good resource for you guys to check out. I highly suggest you check out at least the introductory course if you are going to be teaching students in um, a K-12 setting. So the second resource I wanted to share with you, and again, I'm just going to Google it, um, is Google Search Education. This site that you're going to see me pull up has a ton of resources to help you help your students become better searchers. So it's got at the bottom, as you can see, lesson plans and activities. Um, this is really fun, the Google a day challenge. It gives your kids tasks to do every day, again, short, like a minute or less. So great bell ringers, um, great activities for your students to do as they're getting settled for the day, whether you are a bring your own device classroom or you have um, enough equipment and resources available for you to have a two to one or a three to one ratio. And then lastly, it has a bunch of live trainings for you to take advantage of. So if you're looking to hone your searching skills or just figure out how to teach this with your students, those two last resources that I shared with you um, are going to help you out a lot. So I'm going to navigate back to our Blackboard site. And I want to talk about some of the things that you're responsible for for week three. I'm going to go over here to weekly units. Um, I hope you guys have noticed that I try and give you a quick um, week at a glance. Let me make this available real quick. You're going to see the back, the back end of Blackboard here for a minute. I'm going to make sure week three is available. Permit the users to view this content. Yes. So I'm going to scroll down to week three. Um, I give you the topic for each week. So you're responsible this week for SDT2, Designing and Developing Digital Age Learning Experiences and Assessments. I've told you that you're assigned reading as the lecture, which really isn't reading. It's more watching and interacting. As long as the SDT2 and SDS Four. So in the teacher book, you're looking for um, standard two. And in the student book, I want you to read standard four. You've got your discussion board post. Um, be sure that you are making your initial posts by Wednesday of each week. I cannot stress how imperative that is for you all. Um, it allows your students ample time to make their responses, which again, you're responsible for doing that at least at a minimum of twice by the end of the week. So please, please um, make sure you are participating in that discussion board. A heads up, it's also how I take attendance in an online course. So your assignments this week, visit any links that I've provided for you, actively participate in the discussion. You might want to get started on your technology lesson plan. Um, those are due by the end of week four, the first part of it. I will be posting more information as we go along. And then lastly, you have something called your multimedia project. Oops, I got a typo there. Due this week. I will fix that as soon as I'm done here. So I'm going to go inside week three real fast. As soon as I'm done with this lecture, you'll find it posted inside here. Let's go ahead and go over to the assignments. If you scroll down to the bottom, you will see that your multimedia project, there's a description right there for you to read. So I'm not going to read it for you. I am going to give you the benefit of the doubt um, that you will read through that and look at the directions. Basically, 
I want you to find a unique multimedia tool that you are going to teach the class about. So the web has changed a lot. Um, maybe since, well, since I was in high school, I'm going to date myself here a little bit. Um, we were pretty much limited to multimedia tools that were installed on our computers. So things like PowerPoint or something called Hyper Studio, which was around before PowerPoint, just similar tools like that. So teachers were limited to taking their students to a computer lab or limited to just what was loaded on the computers that they had. Well, the internet has changed a lot since then. Um, something called Web 2.0, um, otherwise known as the Read Write Web, was constructed, um, which allows a plethora of tools for creation purposes to be hosted online that people can use for free. Anywhere from Google Docs to a VoiceThread um, to a Haiku deck, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, your job for this assignment is to evaluate, apply, and reflect on a multimedia tool that can be integrated into the classroom. So, for example, if I were going to choose Google Docs or Google Slides as my presentation tool, I would create a presentation tool about Google Slides. Basically, I'm teaching the class about Google Slides. So hopefully that makes sense. Another example, um, if you discovered a tool like WeVideo, it's a pretty rockin' uh, video creation tool, you're gonna teach us about WeVideo using WeVideo, okay? Um, you are gonna submit your project in two different places. You are going to share it through the discussion board. Um, sharing is caring, have you heard that before? You're gonna share it there so we can all view your project. You can um, either upload it as a file or just share the link to your finished project. Most Web 2.0 multimedia tools allow a sharing feature. You can usually find the link that way. The second way I want you to submit your assignment is directly through Blackboard. So if you click on the title multimedia project, you're gonna get the option to browse your computer and upload your project. So hopefully that makes sense. The other stipulation to this is I do want it to be unique. So I don't want five people reflecting and teaching us all about the same tool. So my advice to you is claim your tool early. If you really feel passionate about doing um, maybe a Prezi, which is a very common multimedia tool that a lot of students pick nowadays, Claim it early, post it in the discussion board, say, hey guys, I'm doing Prezi. I have dibs. Um, I will give you five extra credit points if you tweet a link to your tool and your finished tutorial using our class hashtag MBU373 before the end of the day on 11-9. That is when your assignment is due. It's Sunday by the end of the day. The rubric for this assignment can be found within the syllabus. And... That about concludes our lecture for week three. So Mrs. Blanco's takeaways, so there's not so much choppiness in these lectures. I will plan on doing this possibly in my office before I come home to um, a grouchy three-year-old. So enjoy your week. Please email me if you have any questions. Remember this assignment is due by the end of the week on Sunday by midnight. And have a good week. Thank you.